All right. Well, I'd like to welcome you all today to our virtual artist talk for our exhibition Terra Firma. We're so excited to have this program. Um, just as a reminder, the museum is open Thursdays from 3 to 8 p.m. and Fridays through Sundays from 10 to 4 p.m. You can go to the next. Thank you. And just before everything, I'd like to start today off with a land acknowledgement. As a member of the Los Gatos community, I acknowledge that I am the guest on the ancestral and traditional land of the first people of this region, the present day Moak Maloney tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area, historically and federally recognized as the Verona Band of Alameda County. I support the restoration and sovereignty of this Chechenyo, Tamyan, Rametush, Iwaswa speaking, PIA documented Ohlone tribe, as well as all indigenous peoples. And just to introduce myself, my name is Michelle and I'm the education curator at the museum. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me anytime with questions or thoughts about anything going on at the museum. And so Terra Firma is on view through March 19th. And today we have the honor of having our guest curator, Marianne K. McGrath, facilitating this program. So I'd like to introduce her first. Oh, but before we do that, thank you to our sponsors. Uh, major support for Nunu's exhibition Terra Firma is generously provided by Penumbra, the Robert Lehman Foundation, and Marion Barney Davidge. This activity is supported in part by the California Arts Council, a state agency. So a big thank you to all of our sponsors. So a little bit about Marianne. Marianne is an independent art curator. After many successful years working within museums, including New Mew, curating exhibits and presenting art and education programs, Mary Ann started an independent practice. Her curatorial projects for art institutions and galleries aim to bring art to the community through thoughtful, diverse, locally connected and globally relevant exhibitions. Marianne's passion for art and art education motivates her work as a curator in introducing people to art and contributing to the contemporary art world. Marianne holds a BA degree in art, MA degree in art history, and her professional affiliations include Art Table, College of Art Association, and Women's Pockets for Art. Thank you so much, Marianne. Just a little bit of housekeeping. We have live trans transcripts enabled if you need them. And please drop any questions you have in the chat because we will have time at the end for Q&A. Thank you, Michelle. Before we, get, we begin, I want to thank the Terra Firma artists here with us tonight, as well, of the, as well as those who could not join us. To all of the artists, I appreciate your time and participation in the exhibit. It is an honor to have the opportunity to share your work with the community and talk with you tonight. I also want to thank Michelle and the NUMU team for their support. During tonight's panel, I will briefly introduce each artist and pose a question. And if you have a question, please submit it in the chat and we'll answer them at the end. Um, after all the artists respond to their first question, we will then start to ask the questions from the chat. So let's get started now and begin our panel conversation with Narciso Mart Martinez. Narciso Martinez makes paintings and mixed media compositions that feature portraits and multi-figure compositions of farm, farm laborers set within agricultural landscapes. The works are uniquely composed on found commercial produce boxes. Narciso was born in Oaxaca, Mexico and migrated to the United States when he was 20 years old. He continued his education in the US earning his GED, an associate's degree, a BFA and his MFA. During those years as a student, he sometimes worked in the fields to help pay for school. Today, Narciso's work is exhibited both na nationally and internationally. He is currently featured in several exhibitions, including a solo show, Rethinking Essential, at the Museum of Latin American Art. 
Welcome, Narciso. Um, I would like to ask you, what are your own connections to the land and how does this inform your practice? Uh, thank you, Marianne. Um, well, I feel like I have this um, double connection to the land <laughs> because when I grew, I grew up, like you mentioned in Oaxaca in a small town where people tend their lands, like everyone has small pieces of land where they can uh, plant uh, produce for their own consumption. I remember growing up and my parents planting corn, squash, beans. That was typically what we would do every season. Uh, and I guess we had to, um, we, well, the whole community was at the mercy of the seasons, right? Because th there was no technology, there was no irrigation system. So people, if there was good rain, it was good crops. If it wasn't, then it wasn't. So we had to struggle throughout the year. So that's like, my earliest memories of the land and um so i came to the united states when i was 20 and um and i i i didn't i didn't think i was going to go back to the fields again uh, i came to los angeles and i just were, did a bunch of different jobs um like i worked for restaurants car washes warehouses um a mechanic shop but um but like you mentioned I really wanted to go to school and have an education. So that le led me to um, to find a different way to fund school because when I went to a regular college, it became more expensive. So my brothers uh, who were working in the fields uh, up in Washington State sort of like um, invited me or suggested I should work with them and save my paychecks. And 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 they will help me with uh, food and shelter. So that's what I did. And and all throughout my education, my BFA and MFA, um, I work in the fields every season. And um, and one of the difference I noticed when I was working there is was how um, well and how technology has has taken over um, the 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 lands. No, and I I saw tractors and I saw um, uh, the irrigation systems, how the water comes from a well and then passes through tanks of chemicals that then goes into the plants. So it's like a whole different kind of uh, producing food uh, in, in this country. Well, it's, I'm imagining it's everywhere, but I'm just talking in, in terms of how I grew up and the difference that I experienced over there in, in, in the fields and the difference that I'm experiencing here in the United States. And um, and of course, like the 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 hard work, right? We, I worked there, or I quote unquote worked there, right? Because my parents would take me to the fields, but um, it was for our consumptions. And here, people produce uh, for profit. That's like another big difference, right? And 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 in the way uh, the whole system um, keeps, um, I don't know, um, destroying the land. You know, like. I guess we don't see it like right away, but it seems like little by little, the land keeps um, it's sort of like it depends on those chemicals now because it, I feel like if there is no chemicals, there is no production now because the lands are so used to it. I, I don't know, I'm not like an expert or anything, but for what I experienced, um, I actually was able to work um, for an orchard where I had to manage or oversee uh, some of the chemical applications. And it's just like every time, when, when plants are planted, they are um, applied with some kind of chemicals. When the plants are bearing fruit, they are applied a different kind of chemicals. Uh, if there's too much fruit in the plants, they apply a different kind of chemical so that they drop some of the fruit. Um, if we need a branch in a, a specific area, we apply some kind of solution so that, it, so that our branch is born in that specific area. It's just crazy. What, chemicals can do so I don't know like I cannot I don't want to even imagine what it does to our systems but uh but yeah that's that's my experience and my connections to the land thank you um and thank you for joining us tonight Mar uh, Narciso I know you have your uh, next event and so you can't stay um as long but um, thank you for joining us and sharing your connections with the land and your experiences.
So no, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Um, and now we will hear from Camille Hoffman. Um, Camille Hoffman lives and works in New York. She earned an MFA from Yale University and her BFA from California College of the Arts. She has exhibited her work throughout the United States and in Europe. Camille's practice is a critical reflection on the romantic American landscape as she considers the embedded and latent meanings around light, nature, the frontier, borders, race, gender, and power in influential American landscape paintings of past centuries. She uses materials collected from childhood and her everyday life to craft imaginary landscapes that are grounded in accumulation, personal narrative, and historical crit critique. Welcome, Camille. Um, the question I'd like to ask you, do you see yourself as part of a tradition or an evolution when it comes to making work about the land? Hi, um, good evening. Thank you so much, Marianne. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. Um, so I, as a, as a formally trained painter, um, my work has sort of evolved, um, responding in many ways to the way, to the, um, the ways in which history has been taught, um, in school for me growing up, thinking about my identity, um, as an American citizen, but also in many ways, how, um, my um, identity as a as a mixed race person, um, as a Filipino American, um, also uh, conflicts and in certain ways um, adds to the sort of trajectory of the way that the the romantic American landscape has been uh, historically portrayed. And um, so much of as my work has kind of evolved over time, as I've been thinking um, more critically about, uh, the many lands that I've um, lived on and 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 responding to um, the the sort of uh, the the nature. Um, I've also been thinking about um, how the materials that I collect over time um, and those materials that sort of make up my identity become an extension of that palette. Um, and the work has kind of grown. To be to to work off the canvas and now in in these more immersive spaces where um, the viewers too can become active participants, responding to um, to the work. I I just I guess more specifically I can speak about this piece in the show, uh, which is titled Offshore, um, and the materials included in this work are um, acrylic paint and also stock images of uh, stock vinyl uh, wallpaper of the California coast. Um, the smaller panel uh, hanging within it uh, is made with a traditional um, painting frame that is turned um, in reverse. And I'm using nature calendar, calendars, acrylic paint, and also um, uh, nurses' gowns. Uh, this specific work was actually made on the 435th of the first doctoral uh, United States, Northern Chumash land, which just happened to be in uh, San Luis Obispo, not too far from uh, Los Gatos, uh, further south. And I wanted to kind of zero in on this particular moment, the, the anniversary of this, of this moment and what this has meant as a part of a larger um, legacy of um, the Filipinos um, in, in the Americas um, and also the kind of larger uh, legacy of uh, overseas work. Um, and the, the, in 1587, um, when the first landing happened, is actually, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole history that, that, uh, led to that moment related to the uh, Manila Alcapulco galleon trade um, when the Philippines was a, was a colony of Spain just right before it became a territory of the US. And um, the Filipinos who were working that ship were also um, a, a part of, um, excuse me, my dog is a part of <laughs> this conversation. <laughs> Manu. Um, so 
sorry, sorry, excuse me, Manu. Come here. He always has something to say. He's my uh, my toughest critic in the studio. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, as I as I made this work, uh, I was just sort of kind of reflecting on um, how I can think about both coming and going, and relationship of of, of water and land is also being this kinds of uh, of fluid relationship. Um, but also um, a deeper connection between sort of um, manifest destiny and and uh, looking at it in a kind of a critical lens as far as the larger uh, European and uh, 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 American kind of colonial conquest. So. <laughs> Thank you. Now you can hear me. <laughs> Thank you, Camille. Um, so next, we're going to talk with Bin Dan. Uh, Bin Dan re reconfigures traditional photographic techniques and processes in unconventional ways to delve into the connection between history, identity, and place. Bin is known for his innovative series of chlorophyll prints using photosynthesis to print portraits directly onto the surfaces, surfaces of leaves. He's also noted for his contemporary daguerreotypes of national parks. 11 of them are on view in terra firma. Bin earned his BFA from San Jose State University, where he is now a professor of art, and he received his MFA from Stanford University. His work is collected and exhibited in major museums, and his new book, The Enigma of Belonging, recently premiered at the Paris Photo Show. Welcome, Ben. Um, I'd like to ask you, um, tell us about your work in Terra Firma. What inspired the National Park Series? Great. Well, thank you, Marianne. Um, so very simple question for me. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Although I love all the questions you pose, and I didn't really have a, a preference in which one you wanted to ask, but this is a this is, a, um, so this work in the exhibit started about um, maybe twelve years ago. I started um, playing around with the daguerreotype process, and as uh, many of you know, daguerreotypes were the first photographic process um, invented in eighteen thirty nine. It was the first time that people could make pictures of themselves. And at that time, it was mainly used for portraiture photography. It was not really used for landscape photography because of the way the process worked. It's a little difficult to make um, daguerreotyping in the land. So with that challenge, I wanted to um, just to take it out into the landscape. Um, and one of the neat characteristic of the daguerreotype is that it's a mirror. So it's known as a mirror with a memory. Um, it's basically a, a sheet of silver exposed in the camera and then developed over one mercury. And then you have a one of a kind photographic image um, called daguerreotype. The one uniqueness thing I like about the mirror effect is as a viewer, you also see yourself in the picture. Um, so I was definitely thinking about how do we um, relate to landscape, especially if we're, um, coming from um, different countries as immigrants or refugees to the land and how do we see ourselves as also part of this land. So hence come the National Park as a space for Americans to, to deal with these ideas of, um, of a democracy. You know, I think it's a space of a democracy. Um, and so that's sort of how reason why um, the series started. Um, the other part of it too is that um, when I was a kid, I always loved looking at landscape photography, especially what works by Ansel Adam, black and white photographs of the National Park. And growing up, you know, I never really, uh, my family never really had a chance to go out and into the wilderness. It was something we, we did, you know, even to this day, my, my parents think going out into, going camping was a very weird thing, you know, and they tend to associate the word camp with refugee camp. So it was sort of that idea that, you know, you're gonna be 
exposed to the element. It was something we did when we come to the US. Um, but in America, camping, it's a very sort of like an American thing to do. You know, growing up, I would see pictures of my um, friends going over to their house, seeing pictures of them and going camping. And I always wanted to do that. And, 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 um, and I always wanted, wanted to make pictures like Ansel Adam too. And it wasn't until diving in with the daguerreotype process, I was able to sort of almost recreate these photographs, these imageries, these vista that we're so familiar with in a very new way, in this um, way that we can also reflect on the, the, the actual location and on our own identity in, in relationship to, to this land. So yeah, that's uh, that's some some reason I look forward to. Uh, um, if you have any other questions, feel free to put in the chat box. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. Okay, now we are going to move on to um, Natalia Bird. Um, in her most recent body of work, Natalia Bird uses saturated color, reflective plexiglass, and mirror to push the boundaries of flat surfaces and create shimmering environments. Working at a large scale gives her the opportunity to play with illusion and perspective to recreate the experience of being within nature. Natalia earned her BFA at Oregon State University and an MFA from University of Washington. Natalia also received an MFA from Moscow State Academy of Art and Industrial Design, formerly Stroganov School of Applied Arts in Russia. Her work is, is exhibited nationally and abroad. Hello, Natalia. Hello. Uh, hello again today. <laughs> and uh, as it relates to themes about land, how has your practice changed over time? Um, hi, Marianne and everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm fortunate to have two pieces on the show, and this one and one piece called From a Serious Voyage, the way it started. And so that, and through those pieces, you could easily see the evolution, the way my work was developed for the series. So the first piece, Voyage, was based on my travel experience when I was a kid traveling with my father from Kyrgyzstan, where I was born, to Russia. And um, the travel experience took us like four days and while on the trail, I remember like looking in the window and um, seeing how the landscape would change from mountains to the steps to, I don't know, like the forest. And every time like the, um, the train would stop, different people would enter the train and they would sell different things from like watermelons to melons, then like we would move to um, Kazakhstan and it would be shawls and then close to Russia it would be piroshkis and I would observe people and I would always think like um, how the land just not the land but it's the people who live there it's a journey which they experience throughout their life and um, the thing which they would live out after themselves and and be there and so like I started to make a series based on that. I would think like I would create a, like a tra time traveling capsule and like a travel machine. And I would make a windows and people would see the landscape. They would change through the windows. And then I would place their people throughout the history, through the civil war, through the hard time, through the good times. And it's almost like you observe people through time. And um, while working on the series, I was very uh, like specific about the materials. I used the paper and metallics because uh, metallic paint has these um, qualities, unique qualities. It can change the appearances based on where you're standing. Like if you would move, some images would appear almost like a mirror reality and some they, sometimes they would disappear. And, um, and also I used ink, which would like, help me to kind of uh, create the fluidity of the subject matter which I would like to present. And so like the more I was working, I was thinking like the essence of the paper would become like a second and materials would be very essential for me. And so like for the practice while I was traveling into the United States and here, like um, I remember like 
the thing what would capture me in a, in a land and landscape is the light and space. And I wanted to create this almost like artificial reality compared to what I was doing before. Something like a color candy landscape, but so realistic and people would see themselves inside. And so like I moved towards the plexiglass and mirrors and the plexiglass is very kind of um, artificial material compared to paper, but it allowed me kind of create that feeling of space and light which I was looking for. And um, to make the work, I was using like a very like specific, like very small brushes on that, that green piece, which you see right now on the screen, it's called um, grassy. And it made specifically by Marianne's request. And I think I should dedicate this piece to her because it was a challenging piece for me to create. It was a difficult time in my life. But at the same time, I kind of was thinking about my placement in the world and like how we would come and change and the land would be think which would stay after me. And it was before me and I'm just a little grass, like all, us almost like who would come and go into this world and disappear and hopefully the land would stay forever with us. So that's, I guess, what was my work is about. Thank you, Natalia. Um, so now I would like to introduce Victoria Sambanaris, uh, based in New York. Victoria Sambanaris structures her life around a photographic journey, traversing the American landscape for several months a year. She crosses the country alone, tenting on top of her car. Her large scale project based photographs document the continuing transformation of the American landscape with specific attention given to expanding political, technological and industrial interventions. Victoria received her MFA from Yale University, and her work has been exhibited, widely exhibited in museums and galleries throughout the United States and abroad. She is a recipient of many awards, including the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. Welcome, Victoria. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me to, uh, to speak tonight. And um, uh, the show looks great, everything that I'm seeing so far. So thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you. Uh, well, this is a whole nother conversation. Maybe we can do that after about the grid and um, your yeah. direction and everything. But what I want to ask you right now is, has the land always been a subject that interests you? Um, it, it actually has. It's it's um, very personal and ties back to my childhood, like so many of the other artists um, that have talked here already um, tonight. Um, I grew up in in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. My my parents immigrated from Greece in the 1950s. Um, I remember, I mean, Lancaster is an agricultural, it's known for the Amish community that lives there. I don't know, do you, do you know um, what the Amish community is? Um, that they, they've basically um, rejected social change and technological innovations in, in modern society. So they plow the land with a horse and they don't use electricity. And that was, um, that the, the Amish um, populated the outskirts of Lancaster, Lancaster County, where I grew up. And um, within the city, there were more, a lot of factories, like so many other places in the country at that time in, in the 60s, 70s, um, up until the 80s, I guess. Um, so uh, my family, my parents worked in those factories and, um, uh, we would take drives out to, to the countryside. Um, and I, I remember seeing, you know, the Amish plowing their land. And um, so that those drives kind of stuck with me throughout my life. And um, I, I would, um, I left Lancaster and I went off to college. And um, every time I, I returned to Lancaster, 
I would see the periphery of the highways changing. All, all of that farmland was being developed from wherever I was traveling from, whether it was from um, New York or um, up and down the east coast of, of the country, I would see changes along, along the landscape. And so that became the, the locus of, of my work and my interests that tied, really tied back to, um, to, to those early memories. Um, so the landscape has, has, I mean, I've made my life around driving across the country and doing what we did as a, as a child and as I, as I was a child. Um, so I've, I've made a lifelong project of exploring the country and looking at the development of the landscape and the changes. And it's, it's really um, an, an endless subject matter because everything's constantly changing. Um, uh, so I'll go out for months at a time um, the works project base, and um, I'll look at, at in a particular area of the country. That's um, I'm, I may have read an article or something stimulates the idea, and then I do the research and load up the car with maps and all the books and information that I have, and then I go off for as long as it takes for me to make the work. So it's usually several months at a time. So up to three months at a time. And then I come back, look at film um, and go back out on the road again and reshoot sometimes and um, continue the project. So it takes a few years for me to complete a body of work. Um, did I answer the question? <laughs> Yes, you did. And um, I didn't know. I mean, it's interesting. To, I, I, I can't I don't want to talk myself, really. But um, I love hearing all of your responses and to the questions. I um, I know I've talked with all of you extensively through v email and Zoom and phone calls and all of that studio visits. But um, it's um, so interesting to hear even more from all of you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we'll hear from CJ Chen. Uh, CJ Chen's practice includes painting, photography, installation, and public art. In her mixed media work in terra firma, she employs paper cut, a traditional folk art technique that has been practiced in her, her family for multiple generations to create landscapes that emulate and deviate from traditional Chinese painting and then also represent her immigrant journey and that of many others. CJ received her MFA from Tyler School of Art, Temple University, and her BFA from uh, uh, Guangzhou, Guangzhou. Thank you, Uni Academy yeah. of Fine Arts. Her work is exhibited and collected internationally. CJ lives in Los Angeles, and she maintains studios in Los Angeles, Guangzhou, Gongzhou and Chantel. Yep. Hi, Sija. Hi. You, I want to ask you, how does your technique and materials serve your intention or vision for your work? So um, I would first like to say thank you for having me in the show and in the panel discussion and thank everyone for coming. Um, so like you introduced, about my work uh, is generally, my work in general, in general is about race, uh, immigration, here and there, um, my original culture and the acculturation I'm going through. Um, in terms of Twin Peak, the work that I'm showing in Terra Firma, it is two mountains with paper cut infused, uh, infused media laying on top of them. And I created this work during the uh, during the pandemic when I cannot visit home in Chantel with my uh, to see my uh, families. So this work helped me cope with my separation uh, from them. And because as the two uh, the two peaks are actually from two different mountain ranges, uh, one from my hometown of Chantel, 
and the other from the Hollywood Hills, which uh, is in uh, my backdrop of the home that I live in in Los Angeles. Um, but Twin Peak was also part of a larger series called Across the Water and Climb the Mountains, uh, which was my interpretation, my, uh, <laughs> excuse me, which was my, uh, my interpretation of my experience as a first generation uh, immigrant and the experience I share with many others. Um, the name "Cross the Water" and uh, "Cross the Water" and "Climb the Mountains" actually came from a Chinese idiom, means uh, describing like a long and challenging journey, which I find it resonated resonating with uh, the experience I have. Um, but then, in terms of the technique, it's the technique I use is called paper cut. Excuse me. It's a folk art that, like you said, in my family for generations. My dad is also a paper cut artist. Uh, it's very straightforward. You, usually people use scissors and knives to carve out flowers, animals, um, figures, and then they usually use red paper. And the purpose of it would be for decoration or holiday so, uh, holiday decorations or ceremonies and using this technique made me feel like I'm reconnecting with my root my families my culture because I the longer I spend outside of my home uh, the more I find myself longing for that connection to remind myself who I am and for the materials, instead of using traditional uh, red paper, I expanded and used unconventional materials like uh, immigration forms, uh, magazine papers, um, immigrant immigrant owned business uh, printouts like restaurant menus. And for Twin Peaks, I also uh, collect collected uh, personal memor memorabilia from Asian community uh, from the uh, for, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic as, as part of the material. Because Twin Peak, not, not only it's a reflection of my journey, it's also my response to the racism and mistreatment of the hatred that was directed towards Asian community during this pandemic. So I felt I felt like by using this personal materials, I am presenting the unfiltered and very raw personal experience to my audiences. They're not just looking at the paintings; they can also read, read through our lives, our stories. So and so, my intention for Twin Peaks and in general for my work is for them to serve as a remark uh, for the evolving hardship, the virtues and aspirations that, in my opinion, define the immigrant experience in America today. And I think by using paper cut, this technique to speak to my culture and the material that I related to the theme, I'm hoping that this work, my work can be an analogy for the American dream uh, that during this singular period, uh, singular period in our history. Yeah, I hope that, that answers your question. Yes, it answers the question very eloquently. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Sija. Next, we will talk with Rupi Tut. Rupi Tut creates paintings on paper using handmade pigments. Her work is rooted in personal history. Rupi is a grandchild of refugees, an immigrant, a mother, and a preservationist of traditional Indian painting techniques in use since the 18th century common era. Her work has recently been highlighted through exhibitions at the De Young Museum and Headland Center for the Arts, as well as solo shows at the Triton Museum of Art and Jessica Silverman Gallery. Rupi's work is part of a significant private and public collections within the United States and the United Kingdom, including the Asian Art Museum and the De Young Museum in San Francisco. Welcome, Rupi. Um, I would like to ask you, can you tell us about your ideas you are exploring in When We Meet Again and in your practice right now? 
Thank you, Marianne. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm actually still hung up on all these artists speaking about their work, and now I'm like, I should just go back to painting right now. So <laughs> thank you all for stirring that up. Um, how um, the ideas that I'm exploring in this painting that's titled When We Meet Again, and I apologize for the picture not being as lit up, but, um, you know, as a traditionally trained artist, the idea is always to connect and be a bridge between the past and the present, no matter if it's through the painting style, through the subject matter, through me, through anything. So I think just my purpose in life is to be that bridge um, because I feel like we are not informed for our future if we don't learn from the past. Uh, and our present is not well lived if we don't reflect on both the future and the past. Um, with that said, in When We Meet Again, this is one of the paintings that it's about, it's about 36 by 36. And it's done on this traditional handmade paper that comes from uh, Jaipur in India from a family of paper makers who've done this for hundred years plus. And the traditional pigments that are used on the paper are made in my studio by me, according to my training, the brushes, everything used is very specific to this 18th century painting style, like Marianne said. Um, it's a lot of labor, it's a lot, a lot of hard work. And this painting specifically is at the end of six others that have uh, been made about this idea of land and connecting to land through the idea of water. Because as an immigrant, as someone who's a grandchild of refugees, and as someone still trying to find footing in a, in a land where being brown is not necessarily a position of acceptance and power always, and also then having children who are also going to live in that social and political landscape, um, I feel like land is very similar to water and it's constantly shifting. Uh, and this piece was the last piece and had to be kind of a piece where me tracing back the history and the personal tragedies in my family during partition of India, when Pakistan and India were divided and created, you could say, um, that history and sitting with that personal history is very painful. It is kind of excavating at your heart in a way when you look back at the painful histories of your family or of yourself. Uh, and this piece at the end was kind of a piece where I was like, okay, this was really difficult. I give in. And this piece is talking about that cycle of trauma that you relive every time you are excavating personal history when you're creating a work. Um, and you know, you end up with only one piece of hope that you cling to, which is that, um, hey, at least I'm making something out of it a hopeless situation that is resulting in a hopeful presentation of a history that needs to be spoken of, needs to be reflected back at, not just for me, but also for the community around me. And it's obviously the parallel to doing this is me with my work and, um, you know, trying to now trace back to different cycles of trauma that are not just displacement focused, but also how the women that I've known, whether it's, um, my grandmothers, my mother and myself and my daughter and tracing back that connection of which other trauma we're carrying as baggage. And I think as someone who's had three children, you know, what are those traumas that we are almost impregnated with when we're born? And then we carry them in this heaviness in our heart. Uh, and I think that's where the practice is evolving to right now. But I think that cycle of sitting with the trauma that you experience, whether it's yourself or your community, um, and not knowing what to do with it always. Um, I'm lucky that I'm an artist and I can do something about it, but there's still a lot of silences that need to be, you know, touched and poked around. Uh, and I think that's what this piece specifically is about, about how painful that silence can be. Uh, but at the same time, that's just what my work is right now. And uh, Thank you, Rupi. Uh, now we are going to hear from Shara May. And Shara May is a visual artist whose work is deeply rooted in her painting practice, using the medium to explore the fluidity of memory and the transcendence of self through the language of abstraction and landscape. Born in Tarboro, North Carolina, she currently lives in Oakland. Shara received her BFA degree from the Cochrane College of Art and Design at George Washington University and her MFA in painting from the San Francisco Art Institute. Her work has been exhibited in galleries and museums such as the De Young Museum of San Francisco, Root Division, 
the Diego Rivera Gallery at the San Francisco Art Institute and Jenkins Johnson Gallery and Numu. Her work is included in both pu public and private collections. Welcome, Shara. Thank you. Tell us about your work in Terra Firma. What, what inspired this piece? Okay, well, thank you all for having me and thank you, Marianne, for letting me be a part of this amazing exhibit. Um, I am specifically uh, using landscape uh, as a per personification. Um, and so what you see here is a painting called Helen and it's from my heap series, heap being a pile of or um, an overabundant amount of. And what I try to do in these paintings is to depict this Eden-like environment um, that's filled with beauty, but it's also filled with overabundance and, and decay. I'm really interested in exam examining the beauty and the chaos of the natural world through the lens of abstraction and um, landscape and the language of those two um, ideas in, in art. Um, and so the last few years of my work um, has evolved quite tremendously um, from a focus on Southern landscapes. Uh, as Marianne said, I'm from North Carolina, from a very small town, uh, poor town, population of like 2000. It was the first freed slave town in um, North Carolina. Um, and it, it um, has, a, it's like basically swamp land. Um, a uh, community built on swamp and marshland. Um, and so every few years, because it's, it's relatively cl close to the coast, um, there's a hurricane that um, causes a lot of, of damage in the town and the town had to like pick itself up again. And a lot of my family left um, because we wanted to seek better opportunity. So I was painting a lot of landscapes that focused on those family struggles, but then I decided um, at a certain point in my studio that I wanted to just kind of nip that in the bud. And I wanted to just chase independence and freedom through the literal um, act of painting. Um, and so thinking of landscape uh, as an instrument of cultural power, as so many Western nations have done um, in the past, how can that idea be used to explore my own personal identity as a woman of color? Um, and how can it be used to explore uh, my own experiences with people in my family or people um, that I want to pay homage to? Um, so yeah, I'm thinking of these Eden-like environments as this a way to pay homage to remarkable lives of anonymous uh, people um, and creating almost like a space a, a safety, a safe space for those people. Um, when you think of landscape, uh, you think of how uh, it's different from everyone. We're all from so many different parts of the country, of the world. And when we think of landscape, um, we have these like uh, personal narratives that uh, um, tell us what, uh, what, what is beautiful to us in terms of the land. And so my thoughts on it are like, who's allowed certain views, who's allowed views of safety versus views of danger, and what, do, what views do we see when we look out our, our window, and how does that um, shape our society, shape our, um, our struggles, shape our happiness. So um, this piece uh, is actually quite small for, for my work. Um, but I do like to scale up my work so that it's uh, immersive, so that the person viewing it, um, the art enthusiast, if you will, it is a figure in the landscape and they are immersed into that, that sort of like environment. Uh, a lot of my paintings are named after people. So this one particular is called Helen um, and it's named after my aunt, who's still alive, um, she's getting old though, and um, she's my mom's best friend. Um, and I wanted to just give her uh, a place in history um, while she's still here. And so that um, this, it's that idea of saying their names um, as we do um, in things like the BLM movement, where we um, 
remember people um, and we keep their their lives alive. Um, and that's that's it. I, I want to say one more thing that I'm really interested in how, um, as a Black American, um, we've gone from tending to the land, not um, not freely, but as slaves, to becoming sharecroppers and like still having um, a connection to the land, uh, all the way up to now where um, when you think of Black culture and Black identity, there really is uh, no relationship to the land at all. But I'm interested in reclaiming that relationship. And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shara. Next, we are going to um, hear from Russell Crotty. Russell Crotty's vast body of work explores and expands the idea of works on paper. His practice chronicles an idi idiosyncratic commentary on astronomy, landscape, and the natural and man-made world. Made evident in his drawings, collages, paintings, large-scale books, and drawings on paper-coated suspended globes. Russell was born in San Rafael, California. He earned his BFA with honors from San Francisco Art Institute and an MFA from University of California, Irvine. He is a Guggenheim Fellow, received a Visual Arts Fellowship from the Peter Reed Foundation and a Visual Arts Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. His work is exhibited and collected worldwide. Hello, Russell. I would, I would like to ask you, what ideas are you exploring in your work and in your practice? And how do they relate to your own connections to the land? Well, they, they're sort of, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Well, thanks, thanks for having me. And it's nice to hear all the other artists speak. Um, so the ideas in this, behind this work is basically immersing myself in the landscape and in sort of a sort of a traditional way, you know, taking field notes when we're rock climbing or camping or we do a lot of outdoor stuff. And I have been active like that all my life uh, and sort of connecting with certain places that, that sort of resonate. Uh, the, the drawing you see there on the bottom, the panoramic drawing is a place called Piedra Blanca, which is right up the road from us here in Ojai. And so it's, it's not literal, but it's sort of the full moon rising. And then the text sort of, my text is it's sort of a rant um, about environmental problems. And it ends with uh, Carl Sagan's quote, a pale blue dot. Um, a lot of my work is about sort of, I'm interested in, in the, the universe as an amateur astronomer and have used astronomy in my work for um, 30 years now. Uh, I have a lot of telescopes and I'm always observing. So that um, it's interesting to be in terra firma when actually the, all this stuff has astronomical things going on. Full moon, um, the globe, Scorpio setting, um, the bouldering globe there, the small globe, this says extreme boulder problems, high desert extreme boulder problems. So there's sort of, I locate, I sort of locate these things with, with the text and the text becomes part of the drawing and sometimes strata in the landscape um, and sometimes in the atmosphere uh, as in the panorama there. Uh, right now I'm working on a 10 foot panorama where the Milky Way has text in it and it's, all based on ufology of all things, uh, the sort of belief in uh, UFO sightings, cattle mutilations, crop circles, and all that kind of late night radio stuff from maybe the 90s. Uh, so that's inhabiting the Milky Way above Joshua Tree National Park. Um, so, so basically, also, the text is important in, in some cases in the panoramic book of locating, sort of locating myself in, in a landscape and, and listening to the local vernacular. Like here in Ojai, it was the sort of, you know, you hike in the canyons and do this and then come back and have a 
coffee at the hippy dippy place down the street. So yeah, I, I just use a lot of, of, of that kind of vernacular. Uh, I think the work's fairly uh, traditional in terms of landscape. Um, however, I think the formats I use uh, by drawing on globes, which started as astronomical globes in the 90s and have evolved into more uh, color landscapes as you see. Um, I think the format of large scale books is, is sort of, that, that's sort of pushing the evolution of drawing for me a little bit. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it. It's definitely being connected to something bigger than ourselves. Thank you. Yes, the land is definitely something bigger than all of us. From the sky. And the sky. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Thank you, Russell. You're um, and now finally, we get to hear from Sarah Sense. Weaving together memory, place, and time, Sarah Sense creates her work with traditional Chittimacha and Choctaw techniques of photography and found imagery. She earned her BFA from California State University, Chico, and an MFA from Parsons, the New School for Design in New York. International artist residence, residencies are a part of Sarah's studio practice and, and include a Smithsonian Artist Fellowship for the Chittimacha Reservation, Banff Center, Arizona State University, Santa Rosa Factoria de Art, Santiago, Chile, and Raymaker Gallery, Bristol, England. She is currently a visiting fellow at the British Library, London. Sarah's work can be found in public and private collections worldwide. Hello, Sarah. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you, how does your technique and materials serve your intention or vision for your work? Hi, thank you so much for including me in the exhibition and um, I'm really happy that I got to be a part of this um, online panel this evening. Um, my kids have been fairly good through the talk, but my little one, I think, just discovered what room I'm in, so he might hop on my lap, but that's okay. I'm used to that. Um, yeah, so thank you, and thanks to all the other artists for sharing um, their work. It's, it's really... Um, wonderful to be in an exhibition with artists who are working with concepts of lands and connectedness. Um, and I've loved hearing about how that goes, you know, beyond lands and then into water. And of course, you can't really have one without the other here on earth. And I think, you know, I think that's also something that is a large part of my work and just the way that I um, think about like human connectedness to um, and ancestry and place and our and you know the space that we exist within um, whether it be within like institutions and I know like that word like decolonizing and decolonizing the institution is such a big buzzword right now but I think it's a really important concept to understand and um, that is so much about where I'm at with my work and thinking about like, whether it be, you know, within your question about materializations or uh, techniques and things like, I think it right now will always go back to ideas of decolonizing an institution. Um, as a fellow at the British Library, my research is very much like looking at those maps within the archive that are sort of like stored and collected and put into these British colonial spaces. And I want to find them and like bring them out and do something different with them that is like re-indigenizing them. Teddy's making phone calls on the hotel phone. Come here, can I have that? Um, um, okay. so I think that um I can talk very that's like where I'm at, at the moment with my work these pieces which are from 2016 were made for the World Cultures Museum in Frankfurt Germany and um being a contemporary native artist and um being a part of 
so many uh, contemporary Native art shows within the United States, I find that it's really um, important that I also look at other like histories of my family. And um, my I am Native from my mom. I'm Chittimacha and Choctaw from my mother, both Southeastern tribes of you know, what is now the United States of America, but I'm also non-native from my dad. Um, so for this exhibition in Frankfurt, I thought it was um, important and relevant to look at German archives. So I um, traced back the sort of like birthplace of um, my grandfather, which is in Kiel, Germany, and where his family is from. So he was born in Kiel, but the census Zinza is mostly from Krefeld. So I went to Krefeld to um, go through those archives and the images that you see here, particularly on the left side of your screen, um, that text, that's German text from uh, archives in Krefeld that have my family name in them. Um, and everything and the weaving there is all like abstract. There's no particular like pattern apart from just pulling like the language, the German language forward. The waterfalls reference the um, image in the lower right hand corner. Yeah, just give me like five more minutes. Why aren't, why aren't you bringing me the giant stick bag? You'll get. You'll get your candy when I'm done. If you go into the back to the TV, I'm so sorry. Um, the uh, if you can see, it's hard to see in the on your screen. Probably um, there's a man, a woman, and a child sitting in front of a waterfall, and this is a family photograph. One of the only family photographs that we have of my grandpa since um, before he took a boat from Hamburg to New York, and um, I should say something about like ruptures in family and trauma and like uh, traumatic, his like historical trauma and the way that that affects like uh, how we, you know, how we relate to all of these, you know, all of these things I think that I'm working with in my, in my art, like um, there's, there's a lot of trauma that I think was passed down from my grandpa sets through, you know, through these generations. So the trauma isn't just from my native side, it's very much from my German side as well. Um, so when I was given this photograph, I, um, when I, I went to Germany and I went to, I can't remember now how many cities and towns I visited, but it was probably about six or seven. Um, I lived in Santiago, Chile for some years, and I lived with a lot of Germans there because of like just the house that I that I was in. It was a lot of like exchange, like professionals and uh, students, and um, I lived with Germans. And when I went to Germany, I was very graciously accepted into their homes. And this one home that I went to in Fischenbach, um, which is in the Black Forest. Um, we decided we would go find that waterfall where my grandfather was photographed. So the waterfalls that you see there are, that's a part of that like search for looking for like this location of where my grandfather was photographed before he was, you know, went on a boat and was moved to the United States, which has all of these other like implications and stories to it. Um, this was a was right before World War II. Um, so it's not so much about the waterfall. I think it, of course, like has to do with just like that history and like me longing to like understand or be connected to, or I think in the most eloquent way that I could possibly say it would be to try and understand like where somebody comes from so that I can come to a place of love towards somebody rather than a place of like anger or frustration or if that makes sense. Um, the image on the right hand side, which is from the same series and was also for the World Cultures Museum is imagery of Ireland. Um, 
there's a poem that's written through all of this work that I wrote when Archie was born. Um, Archie, my oldest son, was born in Ireland. Um, my husband is British and because of immigration, we had to move to Ireland and, and wait until we were allowed to live, you know, in one of our own countries to be together. Um, and when I got pregnant with Archie and then in Ireland and then had my first son in Ireland, we were living um, in Connemara at the kind of like at the foot of a mountain in front of a lake. So everything around me was about like land and water. Um, as you probably know, the north west of Ireland rains constantly. So every there's just like water and moisture around you all of the time. And it gets dark in the winter and Archie was born in the winter. And when he was two weeks old, um, I walked to the lake that I was walking every day because it was dark. So I was trying to keep my mood up and I walked to the lake and it started to rain on the lake and I had Archie attached to me. And I just started to think very like deeply and meditatively about what it meant to have a son in Ireland and who had British parents, a British father and a Chittimacha and Choctaw mother with also other like European uh, ancestry, but yet he's born in Ireland. And so the poem that is written through there is very much about like, um, it's called, does water have memory? Um, and I'm sure we can, I can answer that question with, yes, it does, you know? And in that moment, um, that was the first time I really started to think about the memory of water and the way that water, water's memory would like run through a tree or through a human body or through an ocean and a lake and a river and like holding trauma, holding beauty and that, and then pulsing like through this baby that then is like, and he was born in a water bubble as well. So like, then he's born in water, like he's in this protective like water case. So I was just thinking about water so differently and like the way that we're connected to land. And, um, you know, even though Archie was born to parents that didn't have Irish citizenship, um, there's a law that if you're British and born in Ireland, you get an Irish passport. So he is Irish and he's so proud of it. So I think that these works, it's of all of the people, I think it's really interesting to have these two side by side because one is very much being connected to like a grandfather who I was sort of like shielded from and protected from because of his violent nature. And then there's then this other, um, you know, this other piece that's very much about like love and like understanding being connected to land. So it's like reconnection to a land that is so distant because of family rupture and then being connected to land like in the most beautiful intimate way hi <laughs> um I think that's all I have to say thank you Sarah that's thank great you. thank you and I think they did really well <laughs> you did it's great about it. I'll pause myself again um so thank you, Sarah. And now let's see if we have any questions in the chat. Um, oh, we do. Great. Um, okay, let's see. For all the artists, um, since landscape can be an 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 analogous to for many types of stories, when you choose a vista or type of topography to portray, do you choose based on a certain allegiance or familiarity? or based on the symbolism of certain natural elements. So um, I'm gonna open that up to everybody. Um, and if you would like to answer it, you can raise your, raise your hand, I guess, and speak. Um, so. Familiarity uh, plays a big role in what I do, I don't, I don't know. Uh, 
places that you see under different conditions and you experience different things there. And you meet a lot of other people that, that have that same love for that place. Um, and so that can develop into something, but yeah. Plays a role for me, I don't know. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Um, I think I have to agree with Russell. Like for me, it's the same. Um, I need to know the place which I'm working with. And like, usually I travel a lot and then the place just speaks to me, you know, and I take lots of photographs and then my work based on that. And even though like sometimes I tell a story about the people who live on that land, um, just to be on that piece of land is very important, just like, almost to feel it with my whole body and to leave it through the photographs and then I do history about that place and stuff like that, so. Thank you. <laughs> TJ, where are you gonna go? Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Um, I would say to me, it's a combination of both. So, like I mentioned earlier, for example, my work Twin Peak the, the peaks are from specific, very familiar mountains to me, like one from my hometown, one from my LA, so it's familiar. But also mountains, I chose it also as a symbol because in the phrase, in the phrase, I, uh, the, the idioms I was referring to, the title of my series, Cross the Mountain, Across the Water and Climb the Mountains. Mountains represent or is symbolic of something uh, some, some kind of optical, a difficulty, something that has to be overcome. So I chose it for that reason as well. As well. So for me, it's a combination of both when I choose, uh, choose a subject matter or choose what kind of, uh, what kind of mountains I'm depicting. Victoria? Um, yeah, I, I would say it's, it's actually, um, for me, it's curiosity um that sends me to a place because I had I hadn't gone west until I was probably in my 30s and so um the first time I drove across the country I was in awe really of what I was seeing and how enormous <laughs> and huge this country is and um at that point I I thought this this work um, this I'm, this work is cut out for me. Like I'm, I'm have I have worked for the rest of my life exploring this country, and so there's something that um, I'm curious about that sends me to a place. Whether it's you know the U.S. Mex driving the U.S. Mexico border in 2016 before it became. I mean, it's always been a political issue, but um, it it became a more a, a more of a political issue of late. Um, or driving up to Alaska and following the pipeline north to um, Prudhoe Bay um, and exploring that landscape. So it's always something that I'm curious about that sends me to a place to explore. Thanks. Uh, for me, I, I want to chime in and say that um, uh, for me, it's actually about memory, which is related to being familiar with something, but um, since I try and paint without references um, and I take a more sort of like malleability to the landscape, I um, think of how a childhood experience of the land has kind of changed as you get older. And so for instance, my, my references in my head um, probably are amplified um, you know, references of North Carolina are amplified because I'm not, I'm sort of removed from that, but um, it's still that language of familiar, familiarity, but I really am interested in how that breaks down or gets embellished um, as we get older. Um, and, you know, how, how do we portray that as artists? Thanks. And I just, uh, Shara, that was really beautiful the way you said uh, amplified, actually. Uh, so uh, thanks for that. I work completely, so I actually have a fear of the water, but I paint it very often. And uh, 
for me, because I grew up with bedtime stories of a land that my grandparents left, and then I left when I was 12 and I came to the US, and then now I'm a parent of three kids kind of stuck in our house. There's many places I can't go to, or there's many places I haven't been to or won't go get to go to because of all three of those reasons for now. Uh, so for me, my paintings are a visit to that place. Uh, there's no familiarity at all, which is for me, the, the process of familiarizing is to paint it. That was a beautiful question, Julie. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, with, with my work, um, so much of it is about reclaiming these um, mass produced or overly romanticized iterations of landscapes that usually um, are advertised or marketed as like an idea of a place, but really void of um, specific historical context or um, even like human presence. And so I find that when I start with some of these images, it's really kind of about um, reclaiming them and resynthesizing them um, to create um, a hyper-specific experience in place, but at the same time, that hyper-specific place is uh, of my own imagination, or it's something that, that evolves organically. If I'm fusing um, these stock images within my paint, and then I'm responding to the to the landscape or the architecture of the space that I'm uh, working in. Does anybody else want to respond to the question? I think maybe everybody has. Um, How about you, Marianne? How do you feel about landscapes? Oh, gosh. Um, well, obviously, you can tell already that I have a love for the land. I spent, um, I'm outside walking around places um, most mornings. Um, and I think, um, for me, land, um, it connects me to memories, you know, certain places, um, it's memory, it's, um, identity, you know, being from one place or another, I feel connected to places that I maybe even haven't lived in, but because I know my ancestors are from certain places, I feel um, an affection for that place or a, um, a comfort that I didn't expect when I visited some places. Um, and it's also a great source of um, just, um, it's like a meditation for me to be outside. It just like makes me feel good. Um, to be outdoors, I need to be outside every day, um, especially during the pandemic. Um, that's when I mean, I always I've been walking um, daily in the hills around here in Los Gatos, um, and even just in my own neighborhood for for years. And um, during the pandemic, I just walked and walked and I walked a lot. It, it was um, it was like meditative, but it was also healing and calming. Um, so for me, it's a lot of things and it, and it's just so beautiful. Um, it's so beautiful. Um, um, it's nature's artwork, right? So, um, you know, is that a good answer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, the reason why I did this show is I, I then I had done a show at new move when I was on staff about water, um, just a few years ago. And I always felt like there's this other piece, you know, um, somebody had said, like, you can't have the land without the water. I think it was Sarah that was talking. I think it was Sarah. Um, you know, the two go together. And so I always felt like there was this other, um, this another show that I wanted to do and, and at this show about the land. And I had been thinking about it. Um, and again, during the pandemic, I just wrote a bunch of proposals and, and, um, and, wow, they all got accepted. So, yeah. <laughs> so these shows are happening. Um, and I'm just so delighted um, that you're all part of it. And um, 
I see, I love all your work and I, I see um, something really special in each one of the pieces and, and everything you make. You know, some of you made things especially for the show too, which is really, um, you know, really incredible. So thank you. Thank you for everything. And thank you to Numu tonight for hosting this. And um, if anybody, I don't think we have any more um, questions and we're almost at 6.30, so we should all go. Um, the people on the East Coast are probably tired. And <laughs> I think everybody out West here, we're hungry and we wanna go eat something. So um, I just wanna thank all of you and you know, um, thank Numu for all their um, support. Um, uh, Julie um, Ho Sung created all the graphics for the show. And um, I just wanna mention her and call out Cristiano who's here on our, um, our Zoom tonight. He's our, uh, the museum's exhibitions and uh, collections manager and also the preparator. And he's just did a, such a fabulous job with everything. Um, and just everybody, I appreciate um, all of your energy and work and um, to make the show a success. So we'll plan more um, events and um, in the spring, you know, or in January after the holidays, we wanna do um, more programs. I know not everybody was able to participate tonight. So we wanna do some more um, panel discussions and artist walkthroughs and um, we have other things planned. So. Oh, there's a question for Narciso, and he's not here because he is at another Zoom for another show. He's in all these shows right now. Um, in the change that you felt with your relationship with Lynn, so you're working the Lynn. Oh, that's a great question. Well, we need to ask him. Maybe we could get him to come talk to us in the spring, but um, we'll save. Well, I have to um, save the chat. So I'll figure that out. Oh. Okay. I can send it to you. I can send okay, it to great, you. great. Then I will figure it out in front of all of you. Thank you. So well, I just want to say thank you, Marianne, for all the work you did to curate this beautiful show. It's a really big deal for us. We're so excited to have all of these artists here together. And I hope that this program helped all of us. Um, and anyone watching the recording reflect on the land and our own relationships to land and identity and how we're shaped by that. So I'm so excited for more conversations that will come out of all of the artwork. And Terra Firma is on view until March 19th. So definitely come see it in person. We're open Thursday through Sunday. And you can find all of that info on our website. So thank you so much, everyone. Great to thank see you. you. I wish we were all here together in person. <laughs> but thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Right. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.